The Book of Root has been called by scholars of literature the perfect short story. This modest book moves us from tragedy to celebration. It resolves all conflicts, dissipates all tensions, and paves the way for the new harmonious era of monarchy. The ultimate objective of the book is harmony, as seen in the book's structure, themes, and language. In this overview class on Root, I would like to pay attention to the structure and the careful use of language to see the way that they draw our attention to the book's themes. Let's turn our attention first to the structure of the Book of Root. This book is told in four distinct parts, reflected in the chapter division, which largely seems to be an accurate division. In examining these four units, we emerge with a highly structured chiastic narrative in which the first chapter parallels the fourth and chapters two and three clearly parallel one another. This is unlike other Tanakh books, some of which have a concentric structure, books such as Migilat Echa, in which the middle chapter stands alone at the core of the story, the central axis around which all other chapters revolve. The chiastic structure in Root has no middle chapter. It is symmetrical and balanced. It creates a feeling of harmony, a sense that nothing is left unresolved. This harmonious structure supports the goal of the book, which takes place during the period of the judging of the judges, during the period of the book of Shoftim, a time marked by chaos and unstable leadership, a time marked by the absence of monarchy, by Yamim Haheim, Ein Melech Israel. At this time, there was no king in Israel. The ultimate aim of the Book of Root is to launch a balanced society, one that has the Davidic monarchy at its helm. Root's chapters pre present us with the following four scenarios, which I'll tell over in brief. Chapter one presents the problem. There is death and catastrophe in Naomi's family. Naomi's life is laced with bitterness and despair. Her future seems bleak absent of sustenance in the short term and progeny for long-term survival, for continuity for herself and her family. Chapter two provides a resolution for the first problem, lack of food. Chapter three provides a resolution for the second problem, lack of progeny. Chapter four portrays the reversal of the tragic beginnings of the book in chapter one. Where there was death in Naomi's family, there is now birth. Where there was dissolution of the family, there is now marriage and house building. Where there was uncertainty, there is now stability. Where there was catastrophe, there is now redemption. The Book of Root ends with a bright future with the birth of the Davidic dynasty. So you see how chapter one matches chapter four and chapter two parallels chapter three in explaining how we provide the resolution to these problems. Let's look at this, this structure that I delineated above a little more deeply. The problem of the book is clearly stated in chapter one. The story revolves around a family in Beit Lechem, the family of Elimelech, the family of Naomi, whose personal tragedy is conveyed in the first five verses of the book. Tragedy strikes his family in two primary areas. As I said before, loss of food, loss of land, zera ha'adama, the seed of the land, and loss of progeny, zera ha'adam, the seed of humans. Shortage of food endangers Naomi's survival in the short term while the death of her children and the unlikelihood of obtaining any prospects for replacing them threatens her continuity in the long term. Now, note that these two problems that Naomi faces are flip sides of the same coin. They constitute the blessing that God gives Avram. Zera ha'adam v'zera ha'adama, food and land and progeny. Naomi's family loses the blessing of land and progeny, the blessing that God gives Avraham. 
because they have left the path of Avram. They've left the path of loyalty, of leadership, of generosity. Instead of helping their fellow people in Beit Lechem during the time of the famine, they have gone to Moab. They go to a place known for its lack of generosity, a nation that represents the antithesis of Avraham-like qualities. The first chapter of the Book of Ruth portrays a hopeless situation. Naomi is the focus of this chapter. We experience her personal story, her tragedy, and her despair. And although the book focuses on this one family, on the situation of the family of Naomi, it mirrors that of the nation during this period of the Judges. The entire nation in the book of Judges has strayed from the path of Avram. The nation lacks compassion, generosity, loyalty, adequate leadership, and the book of Judges ends with a stone-like story with the portrait of Israel's society that lacks Avram's values. Therefore, it's no surprise that the nation of Israel during the period of the Judges is in danger of losing the blessings of Avram. If you look at the structure of chapter one, it's divided into three parts. The first part, verses one through five, are an introduction that illustrates the family's tragedy, the famine, the journey to Moab, the subsequent deaths of Naomi's husband and sons. This introduction spans over 10 years and describes the past events, the ones that led to Naomi's present catastrophe. Part two of chapter one already leads us to the present. In verses six through 18, Naomi endeavors to dissuade her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, her Moabite daughters-in-law, from accompanying her on her journey back from Moab to Beit Lechem. Naomi pushes her daughters-in-law away, urges them to return to Moab to build a home and a future. Listen to the words that she uses. She says to them, Yitain Hashem lachem umitza'ena minucha isha beit isha. God shall bless you. God shall give this to you. And you should find resting, a resting place or rest, each woman in the house of her husband. Orpah eventually accedes to Naomi's insistent arguments to return to Moab, while Ruth perseveres and remains with a reluctant and bitter Naomi. The third part of this chapter the final part of this chapter, verses 19 through 22, depict Naomi's return to Beit Lechem with Ruth. It's not a very, it's not a very harmonious, it's not a very happy scenario. The scene focuses on Naomi's conversation with the women of Beit Lechem who reject Naomi and completely ignore Ruth. Naomi refutes her own name suggesting that instead of calling her Naomi, which means pleasantness, she should from now on be called Mara, which means bitterness. Chapter one ends with hopelessness and instability, a genuine threat to Naomi's continuity. The townspeople, as I said, are unsupportive and even hostile. And Naomi, who has no land, no means to support herself, no house, may well die of starvation. Now for the moment, I wanna skip the middle two chapters and see how chapter one finds resolution in chapter four. So let's look ahead at chapter four, where Naomi is again the focus of the chapter. The chapter is focused on the problem of Naomi's land and continuity for Naomi's family. And like chapter one, chapter four is divided into three parts, which seem to maintain a structural and thematic relationship with chapter one. Part one of chapter four, from verses one through 13, uh, we have Boaz publicly seeking a resolution for Naomi's land, which is lying fallow, and her future, which is likewise lying fallow, her future of, in terms of having food and having children. And the scenario concludes with Boaz marrying Ruth and ensuring 
that Root is welcomed into the community where she will build her home and her future. Now, note the similarity between the words that, that, that welcome Root into the community in chapter four and Naomi's previous words, which, which we cited in chapter one, which were designed to push Root back to Moab. Isha, bait Isha. Let God give you a resting place, each woman in the house of her husband. And Root is, in chapter four, welcomed into the house of Boaz, the house of Israel, with the words, Yitain Hashem et Ha'isha. Haba'a el betecha. Let the woman who is coming into your house, let her be like Rachel. Let her be like Leah. It's the opposite movement of chapter one. Chapter four welcomes root into the community, welcomes root into the house. The next scene of chapter four, from verses 14 through 17, we have a second conversation between Naomi and the women of the city. Remember the conversation, the encounter between Naomi at the end of chapter one, which featured Naomi's despair. This one expresses great hopes for Naomi's future. Here at the end of chapter four, the women bless Naomi. They offer her child or Ruth's child a name. And instead of ignoring Ruth, they acknowledge her as Naomi's redeemer, the one who has secured her future. The book's final five verses, 18 through 22, they match the introduction to the book. They function as an epilogue which spans over 10 generations and moves us, or spans not over 10 generations, spans 10 generations, and that reminds us of the 10 years of the introduction. These final five verses move us away from the catastrophe, offer us a sense of dynasty and continuity and a glimpse of a promising future. And so chapter four shows us that the tragic story has been resolved. All loose ends have been tied up. Ruth and Boaz are slated to build a house. That word house is mentioned five times in chapter four. There is uh, the mention of a name, which occurs seven times in, in chapter four, as opposed to the loss of Naomi's name in chapter one. We have a sense of stability and continuity. Naomi has a future, she has sustenance, she has progeny, and the townspeople welcome her with blessings. Naomi is the center of chapters one and four. She envelops the book of Ruth, and her story dominates its opening and closing chapters. Yet, despite the fact that this is Naomi's story, the pivotal characters that turn the tide of the book in chapters two and three are Ruth and Boaz. Ruth is the catalyst for the resolution of Naomi's tragedy, and Boaz is the catalyst for Ruth. He provides for Ruth. It is their actions that lie at the heart of the book. Chapters two and three are the heart of the book and their actions propel Naomi's turnaround, her, her return to stability, the restoration of her future. If you look at these two middle chapters, chapters two and three, they mirror each other. Let's look for a minute at the structure of chapter two. Chapter two opens with a brief conversation between Ruth and Naomi in, in verse two, where Ruth expresses her determination to solve the problem of food. She says to Naomi, I'm gonna go down to the field. I'm going to glean those sheaves. That's the first part of the chapter. Part two, which is the bulk of the chapter, describes the meeting of Ruth and Boaz in Boaz's field. That's from verses three through 17. During the course of this encounter between Ruth and Boaz, Boaz solves the problem of food for Ruth, both in the short term, giving her lunch, and for the long term, giving her the rights to pick grain in his field. The chapter concludes as Root returns to Naomi from Boaz's field, this is the third part of the chapter. And when Root returns to Naomi, to, she confers upon Naomi that which Boaz has given her. 
Both in the short term, she gives Naomi her leftovers from lunch, and in the long term, by showing Naomi that she has gleaned an ifa of grain. The result of chapter two is the resolution of the physical immediate threat, that of shortage of food. Boaz provides the solution for Root, and Root passes it forward to Naomi. Now, it's interesting, actually, something that people don't always pay attention to, and that is that Boaz and Naomi never actually meet in the story. Root is the medium between the two. She provides for Naomi that which Boaz has given her. Now, although chapter two settles the problem of the material security of Naomi's family, the short-term existence of Naomi, we have not yet resolved the long-term issue, the one that rests upon the question of progeny. Will this family perpetuate itself? Embedded within this question is the fate of the nation, as I said previously. Will this nation continue? Will the Judean family birth a king, someone who can ensure the future stability of the people in their land? The answer to this question lies in the third climactic chapter of the Book of Ruth. If you look at chapter three, the three-part structure of chapter three mirrors exactly the three-part structure of chapter two. The first part of the third chapter also opens with a conversation between Ruth and Naomi. Verses one through five have here Naomi instead of Ruth express her determination to solve the problem of marriage, the problem of progeny. The second part of the chapter, like we had in chapter two, describes a meeting between Ruth and Boaz, this time not in the field, but on the threshing floor in the Goren. Boaz resolves the problem of marriage for Ruth, giving Ruth six barleys as a symbol of their future children or of her future children. The third part of the chapter, like we saw in chapter two, concludes with Ruth returning home to Naomi in verses 16 through 18. There she informs Naomi of Boaz's actions. She shows Naomi the six barleys that he gave her, and she inspires confidence that the problem will be imminently resolved. The, cha the chapter, chapter three, resolves the long-term threat for Naomi the problem of progeny. And once again, Root and Boaz function at the center of the chapter. Once again, Boaz provides for Root, who then provides for Naomi. Boaz gives Root food and children in chapters two and three, and Root passes these on to Naomi. Now, after chapter, chapter three, the book loses its tension. The two problems have been resolved. And there's no longer a real doubt that the family will be perpetuated. Chapter three leads us to the resolution of all of Naomi's problems in chapter four. Marriage, children, blessings, stability, community, the promising line of kingship. In this short book, all aspects of its tragic beginning have a felicitous resolution. The Book of Root deftly conveys this in its tight chiastic structure where chapter one mirrors chapter four and chapter two mirrors chapter three. And now I wanna turn our attention to the language of the book because this is also, I think, really a remarkable thing that we see in the book. The Book of Root is written masterfully. It conveys its ideas through the careful use of language. And I wanna draw your attention to a few examples of how the book conveys its harmony by employing what I call linguistic mirroring. Look at the book's introductory verses. There we see Naomi is left alone with her without her husband, without her children, vatisha'er ha'isha mishnei yiladeha umeisha. The woman is left without her two children, her shnei deha, without her husband. Later in chapter one, Naomi expresses her skepticism 
that she could ever have children. And she says to her daughters-in-law, even if I said I have hope, even if I would be tonight with a man and somehow would birth children, that is said in a tone of skepticism, of disbelief. The book concludes with words that recall Naomi's disbelief. Yulad ben le Naomi. Indeed, a son has been born to Naomi. Similar words are used at the end of the book to show us the harmonious resolution of the problem of the beginning of the book. A second example. When Naomi returns to Beit Lechem, she expresses, when she's speaking to the women, she expresses God's treatment of her in the following manner. Look at what she says. She says, Ani mle'a halachti v'reikam heshivani Hashem. I left full and God returned me empty. That word reikam, which is you know, not, a very, uh, not a very ubiquitous word, it appears a second time in the book of Ruth. When Ruth returns to Naomi in chapter 3 from her encounter with Boaz on the threshing floor, she shows Naomi the six barleys that Boaz gave her, and she declares, Sheish haseorim ha'ele natan li, ki amarelai al tavoi reikam. El chamotech, right? Boaz said to me, don't come empty to your mother-in-law, right? The book is about making sure that Naomi's emptiness is no longer. Her emptiness is filled. One more example. In that same bitter speech that Naomi makes to the women at the end of chapter one, as we mentioned before, she relinquishes her name. She relinquishes her identity. She declares, Al tikrena li Naomi, kirena li mara. Do not call me Naomi, call me bitter, for God has deeply embittered me. And in her later conversation with the women at the end of chapter four, they also use the word kara twice, but this time to give a name to Naomi's progeny, to restore the name to the family of Naomi. If you look at the end of the book, Vatikrena lo hashchenot shem lemar, Vatikrena shmo oved, it perfectly fits the beginning of the book. The beginning of the book is about the loss of names, and the end of the book is about reacquiring names, reacquiring a sense of identity and continuity. And so we see that this book uses linguistic parallels to show the resolution of its problem. This creates a sense of harmony. Now, before we conclude our brief overview of the book of, of Root, I'd like to draw your attention to one more technical feature that's designed to accentuate the themes of the Megillah. And here again, I refer to the book's careful use of language. This short book employs words that highlight the way in which Root's acts of kindness are rewarded. Now, Chazal recognized that this is a very critical idea in the book of Ruth and actually state that the purpose of the book is to show us how great is the reward for those who do acts of kindness. Lelomdecha kama sachar tov legomlei chasadim. I think that the reason for the centrality of this idea in the book of Ruth lies in the book's broader goals. Don't forget, we said it before, this book moves us toward the establishment of a monarchy. This monarchy is designed to bring stability and justice to a flailing society during the period of the judges. And in a fair world, all acts receive due recompense. Root is launching a world that aims for justness. Now, to illustrate this, Key words in the book consciously highlight the connection between Ruth's acts of kindness and her reward. 
And there are many examples of this. I'm just going to bring a few. Look at the following example. At the beginning of the book, Ruth clings to Naomi in spite of Naomi's attempt to dissuade her. And the pasuk describes virut dovka ba. Ruth cleave to her. Now, not long after that, Boaz generously offers Ruth to cleave to his reaper women in the field, an act that is intended to welcome her. It's an act of kindness. And the words that he uses are, v'cho tidbakin im na'arotai. You should cleave to my young women, to the young women who are working in the field. Again, we see that Ruth's act of cleaving is repaid in kind. Another example, in her speech of loyalty to Naomi, Ruth begins the speech, she opens the speech by imploring Naomi not to insult her, by forcing her to abandon her beloved mother-in-law. She says, al tifki vi leozvech. Do not insult me, do not harm me by making me leave you. And later, Naomi protects Ruth from the harm of the young men in the field using the same words. Naomi says to Ruth, Let them not harm you in a different field. And so Ruth's actions or Ruth's words that uses the word al tifkai, the phrase, do not harm me, come right back to root when Naomi protects her from harm. Another example, and it goes back to that same statement that Root made to Naomi. Root insists that she does not want to abandon Naomi. This idea is further reinforced by Boaz's admiring description of the way in which Ruth leaves her mother and father to cleave to Naomi, but ta'azvi avich vi'imech. Ruth's action of not wanting to abandon Naomi receives due recompense when Boaz instructs, instructs his workers to draw out some sheaves and leave them for Ruth to glean with the words Boaz says to his workers, Ve'azavtem, and you should leave them, ve'likita, so that she can glean them. So again, that word comes back to Ruth as Ruth's reward. Ruth's speech of loyalty to Naomi, the very famous speech, right, where she says, whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou liest, I shall lie, uses the words, ba'asher talini, alin, where you lie, I will lie. And when Ruth meets Boaz on the threshing floor in chapter 3, he gently tells her that she should stay in the field under his protection, and in the morning he will seek a solution for her. The words that he used, lini halila, lodge here tonight. They recall the words of Ruth to Naomi. One final example. Ruth expresses her willingness to obey Naomi in chapter 3. When Naomi asks her to go down to the threshing floor in the middle of the night to meet Boaz, it's a very difficult request. Ruth is not particularly enthusiastic about the request, but she does say to Naomi, Kol asher tomri elai e'ese. Anything you tell me, I will do. Ruth receives a reward for this kind of obedience. When Boaz uses an almost identical phrase, just a few verses later, when, when, when he meets Root on the threshing floor, to express his unhesitating compliance with Root's request, he says to her, Ve'atabiti, and now my daughter, Altiri, do not be afraid. Kol asher tomri e'eselach, anything you say, I will do. Other examples abound, but I think the point is clear. No action in the Book of Root is left unrewarded. Root gets what she deserves because of her kindness, because of her compassion, because of her loyalty. She receives kindness, compassion, and loyalty. Lilomdecha kama sachar tov chasadim. To teach us how great is the reward of those who do kindness. The Book of Root moves us towards a viable, stable, balanced society where actions are meant to be meaningful and problems are meant to be resolved. 
using techniques such as carefully placed language and tightly woven structure, this short, idyllic book with its difficult beginning and triumphant conclusion provides a prelude and a foretaste for the hopeful and promising future, one that is set in motion by the harmonious conditions of the Book of Ruth.